Hello and welcome to The Late Show. I'm Belle Donati, your host. Each day here on the programme, we take a different theme or category of watch and we examine the trends within that theme here on display at the Salon this year. Here is where you'll get to see certain watches up close. Today we're talking all about design. Earlier I went on a walk around the salon to see what's out there. One of the things that differentiates haute horlogerie from regular watchmaking is design. That's everything aesthetic, everything almost architectural in a watch. And it's in this domain that boundaries are being pushed. Let's have a look at what's out there in the Salon this year. And we're going to start here at Bell & Ross. First up, it's the Bell & Ross BR01 Cyberskull Bronze. Bell & Ross presents its famous skull in a futuristic design drawing inspiration from origami, the Japanese art of paper folding. Its bronze case recalls the angular fuselage of stealth planes. The watch acts like a memento mori, a reminder of the brevity of life. It features a 45 by 46.7 millimeter case in bronze, jaw activated by the manual winding, caliber concealed behind the skull. Next up, it's the Chrono Swiss Open Gear Resec Candy Shop. Chrono Swiss opens the door of a candy shop for its mechanical watches. The embossed regulator type display turns into sweets colored by the reflection that changes with the light. This traditional watch embodies the childhood dream of a watch designer. It features a black DLC-coated 44mm steel case, regulator-type display with retrograde seconds, and hand-guilloshed lower dial. The Outlance Vagabond Series 4. Outlance delivers a new interpretation of its Wandering Hours model. The in-house automatic caliber drives the sapphire rotating minutes disc. The three central satellites successively indicate the time with an arrow that points to the minutes display. It features a 43 by 51 millimeter rectangular steel case, which is waterproof to up to 100 meters. A minutes disc over 240 degrees rotating around a central axis. And three satellites for the successive display of the hours. Next up, the Hisec Furtif Skeleton. A highly architectural watch, this furtive piece presented by Hisec is characterized by powerful lines. On this model, the manual winding caliber has been extremely skeletonized to make way for a kinetic vision of the watchmaking art, a vision that plays with depth. It features a black PVD treated 44 by 51 millimeter titanium case with rotating lugs, skeletonized manual caliber displaying hours and minutes, and a balance spring visible on the dial side. Next up, the Ressence Type 8S. The Type 8S is the purest expression of the Ressence design. Its color palette is expanding with a sage green dial. This soft and elegant green instills this 42-gram titanium watch with a sense of serenity. The minimalist aesthetic matches the perfect ergonomics of the model on the wrist. It features a 43mm titanium case, orbital display of the hours and minutes, and it has a total weight of 42 grams. The Roger Dubuis Monobalancier Excalibur Blacklight Spinstone. With this Monobalancier Excalibur Blacklight Spinstone model, Roger Dubuis is offering a new world first. The watch is set with luminescent lab-grown spinels called Spinstone. The patent is pending for the stone cutting of the bezel. It features a 42mm Eon gold case, star-shaped automatic skeleton movement, and case and caliber set with luminescent synthetic spinels. Next up, it's the U-Boat Italo Fontana Dark Moon 44mm camouflage GY Curve Black. This watch plays on shades of grey to assume a camouflage look. The depth effect, which makes the glass disappear, is due to the oil bath that completely fills the watch, including the movement. An air bubble moves around on the dial side to accentuate the immersion effect. It features a 44mm PVD-treated steel case, electromechanical movement immersed in an oil bath, and a curved dial beneath dome-shaped sapphire glass. 
And finally, it's the Ulysse Nardin Blast Tourbillon Blue and Gold. The challenge embraced by the Ulysse Nardin Blast collection is to reinterpret the essence of haute horlogerie with the codes of the 21st century. This watch has a skeleton movement with a flying tourbillon in a modern design inspired by stealth planes. The colors and materials come together to bring out the piece's technical nature. It features a 45 mm case in titanium and rose gold, a flying tourbillon and automatic skeleton movement. Well, there you go. That was a flavour of some of the designs out there this year. We're going to dive into the detail. You know the drill. With our guests here in the studio today, we have Eleanor Picciotto, who is the editor-at-large of Revolution magazine. And then on the other side, Waco, who is the founder of that same magazine uh, and indeed the founder of Grail Watches. Welcome to you both. Thanks very much for being with me Thank today. Thank you very much for having us. I know it's a difficult one because <sighs> design... Let's start with that. What, what do we mean by design when we're talking about watches, Eleanor? How do you define design? I think it really depends on the amount of novelty, creativity, and what changed the perception of what has been going over time from the references we have from 10, 15, 20 years ago all the way up to today. And to me, that's what makes a difference from one era to another, to some extent. And of course, that takes in a little bit of the watchmaking history, which is this notion that about, as you said, 15, 20 years ago, these independent brands came on the scene, they shook things up, they drove things forward. There were a lot of different ideas. Watches went from, you know, some, someone like me who thinks a watch is something that tells the time to something that, quite frankly, I don't even know how to tell the time on some of these watches. Is that for you, design as well? I think design is an expression of singularity, right? And when I say singularity, you have to do something that no one else does, and it's in a reflection of your internal sort of like a, a philosophy, your soul, for lack of a better word. And, and based on that, actually, I would say that very little great design, probably none, is ever done by committee. It's done usually by one individual who's incredibly passionate and has a specific vision. I mean, she's wearing a T-shirt that says, I miss Gerald Genta. Gerald genta has got three amazing references, one of which was reborn this year. He's got the, the Nautilus, he's got the Royal Oak, and he's got, of course, the reborn IWC engineer, which, incidentally, they did a great job of um, because it's a wonderful expression of their singularity. Uh, if you want to talk about you know, other expressions of that, like you look at the Tank Normal that was done in the Platinum Bracelet in a 100-piece limited edition by Cartier this year. That was a watch that was created in 1917 and looks as vibrant and relevant as it does today, today as it was when it was born. So great design is also eternal. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, of course, I agree with everything that he says. To an extent that I think the expression of what you're mentioning goes even beyond design. I think now you're talking more about a piece that has become an icon because of its design. But sometimes design can also be subjective and something that was a design piece a couple of years ago isn't today and it's not necessarily somebody that knows or liked or is being appreciated by that by everyone i think that time is the best judge of that right so for example one of the watches which i know you had one of us to discuss was the list not freak and i think that that well, it's actually it's actually not it's actually one of the not ones the freak, but oddly eleanor was saying before yeah. we came on air yeah. that's one of the ones she would like to discuss much more absolutely so, yeah. because you know again that watch was born in 2001 and it was one of the watches that really introduced us into um movements that are visible and it was the first real act of like poetic expressionism and watchmaking the the difference between that watch and everything that came after it is everything that came after it built mechanisms on top of the movement to spin and look cool, but that watch, the movement itself is giving time. And so there's a purity of expression there that is singular, as I was saying before. But right? see, what's interesting about the way you're talking, is design something we see on the watch or is design, you know, are we talking about the aesthetic or is it more than that? I think design first starts by the key elements that you see visually into your watch. Is it angular? Is it round? Is it, does it have edges? Does it have texture? Is the coloring different? And the fact that you're bringing um, some sort of innovation to it, so design today could be a titanium piece with angle, could be an enamel with, if you talk about, uh, let's say this year, the Van Cleef and Arpels um, enchanted ballerina, you see that on the prongs where they set the stones, they've added a coat of enamel on top of it. So it might not be perceived as design, however, it's something that could probably have never been done years ago, and it's an evolution where People are, are, are expecting a change, they're expecting something different, and whether they like it or not, they may grow in liking it or not. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. I will quote my hero, the gentleman gourmand Hannibal Lecter. Uh, we first that was your hero? One of my heroes. Wow. He, he, uh, he, uh, we first covet with our eyes, right? And so when you look at something, the initial reaction, the aesthetic 
the aesthetics of that object triggering whatever synapses in your brain, which then release dopamine into your body. I mean, that's the creation of emotion. And so when you look at something as you look at a person, that's my girlfriend there, right? So when I look at her, I have that same reaction because she's beautiful, right? And, and, and then the next part is trying to live with that object. Or, uh, and so you need to put it on your wrist and see how it interacts with you. And in the best way, uh, you, you, you start to love it more and more uh, with time. And if, if you are able to love it more with each passing day, as I would imagine also reflects your relationship with the person in your life, that is something that is a wonderful design, right? I'm going to get away from objects and people. I feel like we're, we're conflating the two here a little bit. Yes. Let's, let's get into the salon. Let's get into what we've seen this year. In terms of the trends this year, in a little bit more detail, what have you noticed when we talk design, Eleanor, in terms of, let's say, materials or that architecture, that idea of kind of layering, that sort of thing? So I think, I mean, I'm not sure I should even say that, but design wine this year, I think that brands have have been more on the conservative side. Also, we bear in mind that a watch cycle, and when it comes to creation, it takes two to four years. So mm -hmm. if we go back two years ago, we're in the middle of a COVID crisis. So I'm assuming that brands didn't want to take that many risks because they had no idea what was going to happen. So they went back to their DNA, their core collection, and they tried to add some modern and innovative component to it, but not necessarily design per se. Um, if we just go back to maybe the independent watchmakers as opposed to institutional brands, institutional brands are more on a cushion, rectangular, round shape, uh, but less so more oversized or strange looking watches. I mean, if we look at Cartier, we've seen amazing references, but we're more in the Tank Francaise, the Tank Centre, the Tank Américain. We have the Benoit, which was, um, they've done a, an amazing interpretation of it with the, the cuff Benoit. So it, it's actually a bracelet that, that now tells the time. But we are not going into the, the Clash or the Crash watches. They've got Clash Unlimited, but it's closer to the jewelry collection. But the Crash, which is one of my personal uh, favorite watch, they were none this year because they wanted to stay on a more... Do you agree right. with that yeah, conservatism? Actually, I, I would say, no, I wouldn't say it's conservatism. It goes back to singularity. I would say my prevailing thought this year is there was very little crap. Right, meaning meaning most of the watches so, most of the watches were good, yeah. and yeah. most of the watches were good because people have realized that to be good you need to be true, uh, you know, you need to truly express who you are. So that can happen with a very avant-gardist brand as well. So take for example, Resonance, as we we're talking about, he launched the H8 uh, in this beautiful sage color. His H8 is like his Calatrava. It's a pure expression of his dress watch, which still uses an orbital complication. So it's like very very avant-gardist, but there's something about it that when you put it on your wrist, it feels perennial. And I think that that's what was so important. Like if I looked around the salon, everyone was refining and making their watches better because they want them to endure forever. And that's very unique about the objects that we love, or actually I don't even think of them as objects, I think of them as sort of sentient beings, but they endure forever. There's no other luxury object in that. Though. So you should spend all your money on watches, yeah. right? Yeah. Goodness. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're here to say. Exactly. One thing, though, so I'm, if I'm getting you right, there's a sense that it is uh, maybe less boundary pushing in design, but, as you say, less crap, doing it better, doing everything, refining, making it more perfect. Well, I mean, I can think of two watches off the top of my hat that are, uh, off the top of my head that are, are truly um, sort of modern watches that are extremely innovative and, and really belong to our era. You know, one is the Bulgari Octo Finissimo, which I know is not part of the Salon, but at the same time is an incredibly adventurous watch because of the dynamic tension it creates between something muscular on the wrist, but it's incredibly thin, right? And that watch now, born in 2014, is now nine years old, and I would say has become a contemporary icon. It's extremely daring, and there's room to be daring, of course, right? Another one I would say, which is a relatively recent watch, is the Parmigiani Fleury Etan de PF, right? Which is basically was born, you know, two years ago, created by Guido Torini, who's the new CEO, and that watch also was extremely daring, but gives you a sense of perenniality when you wear it on your wrist, yeah, right? Yeah, because I don't think they, in a sense that, to, to add to what he's saying and to keep that example from the Parmigiani is it's extremely elegant, it's extremely subtle. They're not do, going into something extremely crazy. We were, you were mentioning earlier uh, when you started the show, the bronze girl from uh, Bell & Ross, which is a truly designed piece. But right now to this day, it's interesting because it's mimicking the edges of the stealth engine because they're working on, 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 on the, I mean, on using a bronze material, which has, not really been used uh, over time, and yet, to this day, we love it. In 20, 30 years, will that watch that's being considered a design piece today still? 
I'm not sure. But well, isn't that fashion? Isn't that the, the point, true. really? Yeah. With I was going to say, it's a parallel with fashion. There's another Bell & Ross, right. which is very interesting, which is the BR03. So they've launched yeah. a new version of that uh, this year. Oh, actually, I think it's still under embargo. They will be launching the new <laughs> version of it this year. You heard it here first. And it is an, a wonderful evolution to that original watch, which is also the owners of that brand or the people who are making watches correctly today are interacting with their customer. It used to be they would just make watches by, I don't know, I guess the CEO liked it or the head of communications or whoever liked it. Today, people are, are really interested in what and engage with their customer base, which is so important, right? And so, for example, one thing is that if you're making a watch that's oversized now, you're making the wrong watch. You need to stop, right? Because no one wants that. That's very right? interesting. We, we spoke about that a yeah, little bit before yeah. this trend for smaller watches, actually, right? It's one not thing... a trend. It, it is, that has is always been the, the size of watches. It's just from the 90s, or I guess the early 2000s, we had a brief period where everything became oversized or inflated, right? And, and now we're just returning back to that golden era of like classic sizes, which is great, you know? And I actually want to add something, and maybe it's a question to both of you, is when you think about design, you only think about the shape. You only think about what's happening, the interaction, and what makes that watch singular. But looking at this year's novelty, and you look at the evolution of ceramic and even sapphire, how Hublot has used sapphire in like the fully integrated Big Ben in blue, which is something that has never done before. When you look at what Chanel has been doing, and Chanel, when I mean, they've been using La Pre the Première, the Première watch has been in the collection uh, and designed decades ago and has been one of the most selling watch. They were able to recreate the links in which they clipped, I mean, they clicked, they, 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 they've added and mixed it to a golden diamond links to make it a watch extremely modern, ex extremely design innovative. So my point is design, I think today, you have to incorporate al also um, a material that's making it the piece, a design piece because of how it's made of and not how or why it's made. So this craftsmanship then yep. element comes into it is the savoir-faire, how it's made. I mean, if you create something that's so strong, then you can have room to experiment within that, right? You know, I mean, it's like a musician who creates an extraordinary piece of music several hundred years ago, and then other people come and riff on it, but it's still identifiable as that piece of music. So, you know, you mentioned um, uh, Hublot, like one of my favorite watches, which I was extremely fortunate to get recently, was a blue ceramic um, Royal Oak Offshore Perpetual calendar. Now that watch it basically was launched in the 1980s and hasn't really changed that dramatically over the last you know half century right but that that addition of that material lifts it somehow connects it with like contemporary culture makes it really exciting it kind of supercharges it but it had to be that strong to begin with right and so I it's like the two, two, I mean I'm sorry to cut you but it's like the 222 from Vachon Constantin yes. that was really last year it's it's a watch that, that, that was created right around the same time that Nautilus and, and, the, and the Royal were created. The same way that you look at the Ludo, which is a watch that VCA relaunched this year, it was launched 73 years ago. And it, to this day, a lot of people could agree that it's one of the most beautiful pieces that was launched this year. So we're not going back to something where right now we feel that it's designed, but it's not because it's new, it's just the way it's been reinterpreted. So, but this, this does still sound like there aren't those boundaries being pushed in design because I wonder the appeal of a watch that really pushes boundaries when it comes to design. Who do, who, yeah, yes, but who, who, does, who does it appeal to? Is that something that stays behind a case or is that something that's worn on the wrist? Or is it like your piece of music that you described, yeah. it's kept in a box for a while until people appreciate it? I mean, I think Uwerk is a really good example of that, right? And of course, you know, listen, there, there are important moments where you have cult massive cultural evolutions or revolutions, right? The birth of hip hop in the 80s and the 90s, right? The birth of abstract expressionism in the 1950s, right? The birth of contemporary horological art that happened the early part of the millennium, pushed by, for example, Uwerk. But what was great was they went back to their original watch that was launched in 19, 1997 this year, the 102, and did an interpretation of that. So it goes to show you that we're now entered a period where even things that are super avant-garde mm. can also be incredibly classic. Richard Mille also. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's like the difference between catwalk fashion and the fashion that you buy in the shops. It, it kind of one informs the other, right? What, let's just quickly before, I know we have to end the show fairly soon, but oh, I, I'd let's love stay. to, I know, why not, we'll stay with you. Let's talk about different I'd things. Love, yeah. But I'd love, I'd love to know, because I know the designers, the actual design, the watchmaking designers have become names in themselves. There's a cachet now to the individual designers. How much does that kind of go in, I guess, contrast and conflict sometimes with the maison? You've got the house that's creating, and then you've got the designer that's sought after by certain 
brands. Does that kind of work against or for? I think you've, if you've built a powerful enough foundation, then you can be very open about your collaborations because you're strong enough to. So IWC is a good example of that. They celebrated the association of Gerald Genta with the engineer. They even invited um, his, his wife um, to, uh, to participate in the communication related to that watch. So I think that if you have that, it's like a person, right? Like, okay, Eleanor is my editor at large in Switzerland. Am I happy that she does more, you know, is more out there than I am? Of course I am because I'm pretty much secure in that, you know, I think I know what I'm doing. So I'm happy for her to be a star, right? Like, in fact, I would like to be less in the foreground. Is this a therapy session? Yes. Yeah, I, I just want to like chill, right? <laughs> I'm so old and I'm so tired. I love, I love the honesty. I absolutely love the honesty. This is a man who has been at the salon for what, six, seven days yeah, now? Yeah, and yeah, is dead, dead, dead a woman. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. However, he's the one talking about being tired. Uh, yeah. one, one quick word from you, because I saw you wanted to see just, we've got about 10 seconds left, and then I think you were going to rebound on what Waco was saying just then. No, I mean, quite frankly, he said it all, but when you look at the evolution, I mean, if we have to wrap up the whole design subject, I think it's a word that that has an evolution that it will evolve through time and over time endlessly, almost like a perfect lander. Oh, well, there you go. That is a beautiful and very poetic uh, way to end uh, this particular conversation. Eleanor and Wei, thank you very much uh, for being thank my guest today. Thank you, very much. thank you for watching us here on WatchesAndWonders.com. We have uh, one more session, one more episode tomorrow. Please do join us for that. We're going to be talking about craftsmanship, which is something we touched on uh, today. So Can tune in for, yeah, well, there, Eleanor wants to come back. So we might have three <laughs> guests, which will be wonderful. We'll see you then. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.